thank you for joining us. Andrew Mason is the founder and CEO of Descript. I keep saying Descript, so I got I to gotta pronounce the, the E's at the beginning. Uh, Descript is a suite of simple and powerful collaborative tools for new media creators. Their goal is to enable creators to focus on developing their craft instead of their usage of tools. Descript was founded in San Francisco in 2017 out of a prior company, Detour, which we'll talk a little bit about. Before Detour, Andrew was founder and CEO of Groupon, a company that really needs no uh, introduction. Uh, everyone, everyone knows how fantastic Groupon is. Descript has raised uh, $50 million from a great crew of investors, including uh, most recently Spark Capital, as well as Andreessen Horowitz and Redpoint Ventures. Today, in our fireside chat, Andrew and I will dive into the founding story of Descript, the future of audio and creative tools, the magic of overdub, and whatever else there's time for. Uh, so we'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes, um, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. We want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you're listening in the audience, please use the Q&A portal to toss questions uh, to myself and Andrew, and we'll, uh, we'll get to those towards the back half of the, of the session. So welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Where do we find you today? Are you out in, in sunny California? I am in Berkeley, California. Berkeley, California. Wow. Well, uh, we're starting to get a little bit of the, the warm weather on, on this, side of the, this side of the States. So um, it's, it's nice to finally emerge from our apartment cocoons and, and <laughs> breathe some fresh air for once. So um, we're thrilled to have you at Design Driven. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, maybe to kick us off, I'd love to just rewind the clock a bit to the founding story of Descript. So would you mind setting the stage for the audience and maybe bringing us back to maybe the detour days and, and when you started to, to build out Descript? Sure. Um, so I, I left Groupon in 2013 and immediately moved to, uh, to San Francisco and, and got busy starting another company. And uh, the idea that I had was one that was kind of in, in the back, the back on the back burner. Um, <clears throat> I had always wanted a really cool, I, I always wanted a better way to explore cities. Um, always thought that the idea of audio tours uh, could be better explored with uh, the advent of cell phones. And you could do something really cool where you find the people who really know the city best and get them to create something that's really immersive and makes it feel like they're kind of holding you by the hand and, and walking you through it. So that was the idea for Detour. It was basically like a glorified podcast platform where half the company was building technology that made this augmented reality location-based experience. And the other half of the company were like ex-public radio reporters who were making the content. Eventually we wanted anyone to be able to make the content, but in the early days we used the uh, people on staff to, to dog food to dog food and figure out what it is that we would need to build and very quickly got a lesson in how difficult that would be because of the nature of producing narrative audio content there's a learning curve to the tools and even once you get over the learning curve it just never stops being tedious and slow and technical um, even for people who know the tools really well and this was at about the same time that automatic transcription had reached a, an inflection point where it was good enough to be useful for stuff. Yeah. So we had a pretty pedestrian insight, like what if you just built a audio editor that works like a, a document where you could edit by right. editing the text. And, and so we built that inside of Descript as a, uh, as a prototype, which was honestly like totally irresponsible, like to, to be building another huge application while well, we had another application that was pre-product market fit. Yep. Um, but we did it anyway. And um, as soon as we built it, we realized it was really fun to work on and, and it could potentially be big and, and apply to video. So we spun it out as its own company. And uh, the journey for the last three years has been, you know, starting as a pretty basic transcription tool then moving on to have full podcasting editing features and now full video yep. editing features. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I'd love to to double click into that decision point to really spin out D Descript. Um, you know, you referenced loosely that everyone internally felt like this was such a, a useful uh, kind of sub product of Detour. Was there? Was there a moment or was there, um, you know, a series of, uh, you know, potential customer interviews or was there any additional um, kind of uh, 
time that you, or a like decision point that you decided, all right, now it's time to really like lean into Descript. There was a little bit more gradual in your, in your um, focus to, to pivot. Um, so from the beginning, when we decided, I, I, I'm going to answer this, but also I, I'm just conscious of like this. I think this is bad advice or at least like, it's funny <laughs> because I was, yeah. I was, um, advising at Y Combinator at the same time yep. and telling all these other companies to basically do the, the opposite of what we were doing, which was like, as soon as we started working on this, we treated it almost as like a company within the company where we had gotcha. staff that were dedicated to working on Detour, just because from the beginning, we knew that there was a possibility that Detour wouldn't work. We had already at that point been watching it not work for yeah. a year or so. And, 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 and tried to structure things in a way that we would be able to spin it off if, if we needed to. So, you know, eventually with, with Detour, we just got to a point where we felt like we had tried everything. Yep. And then it was just like, can we sell this thing or, or do we shut it down? And then let's keep going with the thing that we haven't explored yet fully and, uh, and, and, and figure out how to release that as an external product. Gotcha. Gotcha. And did, was that was that also at the point where you needed to kind of go out and um, raise capital for this new venture that was Descript, and that's when you kind of allocated more time and effort to building out that team and scaling that team and kind of letting go a little bit of Detour. Yeah, when Detour was always more speculative, and and I think consumer apps by their nature are this way, and it was a it was a unfortunate combination of having that speculative quality where you're trying to you're trying to um, elicit a new human behavior. Right. Uh, it, it, and, but it also was a big technology lift. Like there was a lot of stuff that you had to build and, and those things don't usually pair well with investors. So I actually never tried to raise money for it. And I, and, and I wanted a break from investors for a while at that point. By the yeah. time we got to, to Descript, it was a much clear, like it was, it was much, it felt like much more of a layup from an investor yeah. point of view. Yeah. There, for some people, there was some early questions about like how big is podcasting and, uh, but, uh, but looking beyond that, it was self-evident how it would fit in and, and make money and so on. And, uh, and at that point I was actually um, anxious to have investors again and somebody that, uh, somebody in a paternal role that cared enough to um, be mad when I'm not doing things right. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that actually in a, in a prior, in a prior interview, I was listening to just the having some external stakeholders uh, lights a little bit of a fire or, or maybe holds you or, and or the team maybe a little bit more accountable for better or for worse for, you know, when you're, when you're building an early product, is that, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, totally. Especially if you have the right ones who who know how to wield that power over you, which is yeah, which is lightly. You don't. I mean, with good people, I don't think you have to point it out. Right, right, right. Absolutely, it's more get out of get out of the way. In in many instances, um, I'd love to I'd love to return to the analogy of the word processor for audio. So you you wrote a blog post back in 2017, right around the time that you were starting to dedicate much more focus to Descript. And in it, you say, we're living through a rapid shift in media consumption from print to audio and video. Unlike the word processor, the creation tools for audio and video are complicated, slow, and require an ongoing diet of training. Can you explain a, a little bit more about why you love that analogy of the word processor and, and why it fits so well with, with the world of Descript? Yeah, I mean, nobody looks at something like Microsoft Word and thinks, did you see my cat just now? I did, I did see that. <laughs> That was glorious. We'll have to Sorry. have an outtakes. This doesn't uh, normally happen, but I guess it's okay. It's all good. Um, At least we know the so, background is is real and not you know not fake. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but but if you think about it, like the word processor is really the gold standard of creative tools. If if you're a writer, you learn how to type at the beginning of your career. And, and that's it. Like, that's all you have to think about with tools. The rest of your career is purely dedicated to your craft of becoming a better and better writer. If right. you're working in audio or video, that's not the case. There's this constant um, 
tax of needing to stay up to date with the tools and fighting with the tools and learning to use the tools better. You know, when's the last time you've done a, a YouTube search for like word processing tips or, or something like that? <laughs> right. Clippy. Um, Where's Clippy? Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, so I think like just in terms of the, the least amount of cognitive friction that the tool introduces between a thought and its expression, nothing beats the word processor. It's yeah. also incredibly flexible, right? So uh, in its heyday, Microsoft Word was being used and still it's being used for, you know, writing down meeting notes or recipes or poems or your PhD dissertation or your business plan. It just scales to all kinds of different users and all kinds of different use cases. And that's what we're aspiring to build with Descript, something where we, we don't have to choose between power and ease of use and, and we can right. build one tool that, that, that can accommodate all those things. I love that. Yeah, one other, one other uh, characteristic that you actually mentioned in that initial blog post that I'd love to double click on and that I felt as a, as a personal user of, of the platform is this product characteristic of building a fun product, both probably for you and the team on the back end and also for, for users. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you build fun into a product and, and how tactically do you, uh, you know, embed that? Is it, is it just a company mission on the wall? Is it embedded into like product docs? Like, do you think about it that actively and that daily or is it a little bit more higher level? Yeah, we, we do. We talk about making editing fun a lot. Um, we used to talk about uh, our goal being make hard things easy, make slow things fast, make impossible things possible. And we actually have a kind of prioritized list of what are the things right now that are hard, slow, or impossible. And that yep. is one of the major inputs into our uh, into how we come up with our priorities. And then at some point we realized those three things could just be reduced to, is it fun? And so right. as we're using Descript, we have a background process running asking like, is this fun right now? You know, the, this, this pro and there are things in Descript that are not fun. Like if you need to set volume uh, or, or set the level, like do volume automation and stuff like that, that's not fun. And, yep. and so we, and we just notice that and think about how can we, how can we make this more fun? Because like that to us is just the key to um, the key to, making audio and video editing as uh, as mainstream and boring an enterprise as text editing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, w with respect to uh, the, the kind of target customer or, you know, do, do you have like internal personas of saying, hey, we're kind of focused on the, the YouTube creator level of skills or more basic than that or more professional than that? Are there multiple personas? Is it one more general persona that you kind of think about when you're building building out Descript? Yeah, well, we think about personas and then within that we think about these different use cases that sometimes uh, straddle personas. Um, so like the, a basic two axis model is uh, the, the pro user who already knows how to use the timeline editor, knows all the keyboard right. shortcuts. And then your um, your your more like recent and podcaster or someone I don't want to say amateur but somebody who's more of a a, a storyteller and and but 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 doesn't know the ins and outs of of these technical tools right. and then the other dimension is what's the medium that they're working for and in is it just pure text or are they just trying to get transcripts out is it audio where they're making podcasts or is it video and then within video there's a bunch of sub use cases. Yeah. And as much as we can, when we're building features, we try to account for the different use cases and the different and the different um, user workflow, the, the different user types, and yep. and take those things into account. You know, so when we're building a feature like you know adjusting clip speed, we'll look at what everybody else does, and we'll and, and we're also doing this weird exercise. Like, not only are we kind of taking all the conventions of timeline-based editing and grafting them onto a document, which is a design right. challenge. We're also merging the conventions of audio editors and video editors, which are which which are similar in many ways, but there's some significant right. differences. 
and trying to figure out how many of those are just an accident of history and how many of them like are some kind of fundamental difference between that that's intrinsic to the medium that they're producing for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. One, one area, just knowing a little bit about both as a user and as a, a viewer of kind of the pro tools and then the simple tools, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you think about um, does, does simple and fun always evolve into kind of complex and over, over featured? Like did, do you believe, and, and, and do you try to, uh, slow that progression at Descript or be very cognizant that you're not going to just become, uh, you know, an overloaded Premiere Pro or an overloaded, you know, Audacity? Like, do you guys think actively about when not to build features or when not to go to Pro Tool or, or too simple? Does that make sense? We do. And, and I think something that we do pretty well, at least now, I think this is something that's good about us. If, if we end up getting, uh, um, crushed by competitors while we're navel gazing, then I may feel differently in a couple of years, but we spend a lot of time going back and revisiting some of the fundamental interaction design decisions that we've made because, um, uh, because again, there's this, like, there's this exercise of, of moving the conventions of timeline based editing to a document format and, and getting that right, right is, Hopefully, will feel simple and intuitive, but yep. um, there's a lot of like big, complicated decisions to make, and there are things that we feel like we still haven't gotten right, and we're just com continuing to chip away at. For example, like one of the first things people would always notice when they open Descript is that you can't use the space bar to play or pause, and right. only only like a couple months ago, after after five years of development, did we figure out a way to adjust the text editing modes to such that you could actually have that feature. Um, right. And there's other things like that. That So, so like maybe half of our effort is, is, is on new feature development and the other half is just on like continuing to refine the basic primitives um, right. so that, so that we can expand. And, and, and that's something, uh, one other thing I'll say about this is I look at tools like, Notion, for example, that yep. just that like I came up in consumer uh, marketplace design where you learn to believe that consumers have that just like users have no tolerance for complexity at all. Right. Like, oh, there's two fields on this page. Let's how can we get it down <laughs> to many. one field? Right. Yeah. Right, or right. whatever. Right. And and like, there's a bunch of evidence that maybe that's wrong when you look at like the complexity that people can pick up in video game onboarding and so on. But, yep, yep. but setting that aside, like you look at tools like, like Notion and the kinds of like, they've done a, a really good job at, um, at just creating these, these basic primitives, yep. these design building blocks that people can figure out how they work and then build incredibly complex things with them. Right. And that's been a learning for me and still trying to find the right balance. But, but I think like consumers have more tolerance for, uh, for that sort of stuff. If, if, you, if you can help, the, the, then we give them credit for it. As long as you can make sure that, you, that they understand the basic language and that that language right. is, is very simple. Yeah, I love that. And what, what it made me think of a little bit is, um, you know, retaining some of the magic in the product, but not hitting the user over the head with it. Like when I open up Descript, it doesn't say we have overdub and it's the most magical thing, you know, in the world. And if I, if I search for it, or if I, if I know where to look, or if maybe Descript has like a lightweight onboarding, then it's presented to me. But that's, I think what some tools like Descript and Notion do really well is they have so much feature. So, so they're so rich in what you can do. Um, they just don't present it all to you up front. It's not, it's not like overbearing. Um, would you mind just sharing with the audience a little bit about what overdub is and uh, how, it, how it came to be? Because I think it's obviously one of Descript's most popular features. Yeah, overdub is, in short, it's voice cloning. So, so you upload uh, anywhere between 10 to 30 minutes of, of your voice. And then we train a voice model and then you can type text to speech and it sounds like really a lot like you, like it sounds like you, it's pretty good. And, uh, and, and, and that might sound like, oh, that's cool. Like cool for playing a joke on someone or something. But what's really <laughs> cool is we've built it in a way where 
um, where we've really focused in on this use case of making corrections to organically recorded audio. Cause that's like one of the most tedious pain in the ass parts of, of recording stuff is you've made a mistake or like you've done a voiceover for a product video or something like that. And now something's changed, whatever. Right. And you have to go in and re-record it and make sure the recording conditions are the same and everything. So with overdub, you can just delete the old word, type a new one, and it will pick up the uh, intonation of what's happening on the boundaries and blend it in so that it's it sounds it sounds natural. Um, it's AI, you know, like other AI, it doesn't work perfectly a hundred percent of the time, but but it's like it's pretty seamless, and if you and it works well, like far more than it than it doesn't. Um, the way it came to be is it, the technology came from a company called Liarbird that uh, um, was uh, founded up in in Montreal, and it really built this incre this incredible. Uh, generative media technology. And as we got to know those folks, it just felt like a perfect uh, hand in glove partnership to team up. So, so we came together a couple of, a couple of year or two ago. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I actually, I heard that I saw, I saw and heard that you and your wife uh, had merged voices and there was a, a new uh, a new a sentient being out there that was able to speak through, <laughs> via via overdub. So, um, pretty pretty wild. And and uh, again, just a, from a from a tactical and also just magical standpoint, uh, incredible incredible feature of the product. Um, just for the audience, we're coming up on time here, so I want to make sure we have time for audience questions. By all means, use the Q and A portal to ask some questions of Andrew. We'll get to a couple. Um, what I'd love to do is maybe ask you one more, and then a quick lightning round, and then we'll jump to audience Q and A to close us out. Does that sound good? Great. Awesome. So uh, I'd love to hear um, a little bit more about the team. So we have a bunch of aspiring founders in the audience. Um, talk us through it. The last figure I saw was 40, roughly 40 folks um, on yeah. the team, but maybe that's grown a bit. We'll just uh, give an overview of kind of what, how the team's structured and um, you know, who we, who, where the key focuses are for building out that, that org. Yeah, so at the end of last year, we closed our Series B and, and we started this year with about 40 people. Um, of those 40 people, m mostly engineers and researchers, and then one designer and, uh, and no one really on, in marketing um, uh, and and a couple people in HR, a couple people in business development. So just very, very engineering heavy. So in the last yep. three weeks, we've hired our first product manager. We've hired our first uh, um, per, uh, marketer and, um, and we're starting to build out some of these other functional areas of the company, but we were, we were running pretty lean before then. Yeah. And just curious, what was the, was there, uh, you know, impetus for that first product manager when you when you hired them was it like hey we just we have people that are doing kind of a, no, a number of jobs that aren't really their core focus and we just need someone to come in here and kind of be the the key leader on that or was there something else i'm just always curious when new new functions are introduced to an org what was the kind of impetus for it well i mean we have so many i so many engineers, our ratio was like, you know, one to 20 with, with me serving right. as the product manager. And so it was just like crazy overdue even, but, but then what happened was we split the engineering team into four different teams. And then yep. it started to become quite painful to not have a, right. a product manager right. partner uh, with, with each of the teams. Um, so it was just, it was just size and, um, and, and then dividing into teams. Awesome. Well, as we wait for a couple questions to come through, um, I have a few more uh, here as we're going to 5.30 before we flip to Kim. Um, audio, let's talk audio as, a, as just a, a general space right now, because there's a lot going on. There's, you know, every day there's a new social audio app. Uh, Clubhouse has done a lot to kind of repopularize social audio, egalitarian audio. There's AirPods as a platform potentially emerging it's almost, you know, back to the detour days of being able to walk around and have, you know, that in your, in your, any predictions that you want to share just on the state of audio? I know it's a really large nebulous topic, but going forward for the next, you know, three to five years. Yeah. You know, um, 
I'm, I've, I've never been much of a prog prognosticator on, on this topic <laughs> in part because like uh, on the, we, we've seen podcasting as a, as a very important space for us, but, but it's just part of what we do and, and video is a big part of it too. I think yep. the one thing that maybe we see that not everyone might see as uh, th the same way is is just that the boundaries between audio and video are much blurrier than um, right, right. And the tools make them out to be like, if you think about the kind of content that's on that you watch on YouTube, a lot of it, you can just put in your pocket and listen to like listen. It's a podcast. Yep. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. You know, you have tool, you have creation tools like Descript that are trying to be nimble between the two mediums. Um, but also on the platforms front, it'll be easy, interesting to see how, you know, like Spotify, for example, um, evolves and, and YouTube. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. Well, let's do a quick lightning round. Um, uh, most creative use case of Descript to date. If there's one that pops to mind. Um, I love the ones where people put together like tutorial videos that are made entirely with overdub voices. Um, so we've seen a, a bunch of those that are, uh, that are pretty inspiring. Awesome. Um, knowing that you like tools to be kind of in the background and, and let folks focus on their craft. Is there one other tool that you can't live without personal or professional that more founders should utilize? Um, yeah, I love tools. My favorite of the modern breed of, um, of kind of like word table low code yep. apps is Coda. Um, I think Coda is just has the, the compared to Airtable or Notion has made some of the, they're all incredible platforms with some really great ideas, but I think Coda's ideas are the best. Yeah. We had Shashir actually speak at Design Driven uh, two or three months ago. So it was fantastic oh, cool. to hear from him. He's and, so smart. Uh, he's like the kind of CEO that just gives you imposter syndrome. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I got that interviewing him. It was a little intimidating. He was like, oh, I'm buddies with uh, Khan from Khan Academy. And, and that's when we were just chatting the other day. I was like, oh, wow, this is different, different circles. Um, one, one mantra that you live and or lead by. A mantra that I uh, live or lead by? Uh, um, the... The, uh, I would say that the world's problems can rarely be explained by someone being evil, crazy, or stupid. Love it. That's great. And then uh, final question. Um, is there anything else you'd like to plug uh, from Descript's side? Anything else you want to tell the audience about roles that you guys are hiring for um, before we call it a close? Um, I got a new album coming out of, of uh, Christmas music. Um, so that'll be dropping in, um, in the summer. Awesome. That's great. Just in time for, just in time for, uh, for Christmas. So we'll all, we'll all go out there and, and, and get it and be sure to uh, play it, play it across, across the world. So um, Andrew, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to uh, join the design driven community and uh, for those of you who haven't checked out Descript, you can find them at Descript.com um, and go, go try out the product. So thanks a lot for joining us, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Jack. And we will, uh, we'll talk again soon.